Thank you very much, Valentina, and um, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you for the to the organizer for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. Um, I'm not very far because I'm coming from Geneva and arrived this morning only, so I missed all the presentation of yesterday. But I hope that uh, this session can complement uh, uh, what you have heard in other session. And apologies in advance if we are repeating some messages. Uh, uh, we just hope to try to uh, make uh, best, use, best use of your time as well. So it's my honor also to start uh, with this presentation. So I will go uh, quickly through it. And um, I'll first start with this uh, timeline that shows uh, all the uh, uh, epidemics and, and pandemics we have had since the beginning of the century, or at least the one that uh, um, triggered some kind of declaration in the international health regulation. And so you have, of course, SARS, H5N1, H1N1, cholera, Ebola, MERS, Zika, plague, um, Ebola, uh, COVID, of course, Mpox, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, but what is interesting in this slide is also to see that um, uh, every time we have had uh, uh, an epidemic or a large, uh, large epidemic or a pandemic, uh, it has triggered some changes in the uh, uh, global health architecture. Uh, either with uh, new um, entities like Gavi at the beginning of um, the 20th century or um, a new um, international agreements like, for example, uh, the PIP framework after the H1N1 pandemic. And so uh, it's exactly the same thing that is happening now, and I will talk about it at the end of my presentation. Uh, but every time we have had a big outbreak or... Um, a pandemic, uh, there was this issue of equity uh, because, of course, the world is very diverse. You have uh, uh, low income countries, uh, high income countries, and of course, the equity uh, in the access uh, to countermeasures uh, is a very important issue. But again, here I am highlighting that there is a difference between equity and equality. Uh, really, equity for us, at least in public health terms, it's really equity based on public health needs. Uh, and so really, uh, it's uh, the assessment of needs of population is also a very critical uh, aspect of equity. So COVID-19, of course, um, was... Um, I mean, we saw exactly the same phenomenon as before, uh, meaning that there was um, um, a real inequal access to at least COVID-19 vaccine, because we are talking mostly about vaccine here. Uh, and um, although if you look at uh, the coverage of the total population, 70% of more of the population have had access to vaccine, at least the, the first dose, um, uh, but uh, really, uh, when you look only at, at um, uh, low-income countries, uh, in these countries, only 35% of the population has had access. So uh, it's just to show that uh, really, um, if we talk about uh, access and equity, uh, we still have a lot to do uh, to improve this. Um, and what we see usually when we are in a crisis is at the beginning, at least you have a very low supply. Uh, and so uh, you have many mechanisms that come into place, either the first come, first serve, so the first uh, having the cases have, buy all the, the vaccines, um, or it's uh, when you are rich and you can order for many millions of vaccines, you get them all. And so uh, many ca countries, small countries, uh, even like Switzerland, for instance, it's a small country. Uh, it was difficult for them, even if they have the money to buy vaccine, because it's just there was no vaccine available for small country or small quantities. Uh, we have seen exactly the same with uh, Mpox recently with the vaccine. Uh, small countries asking for a small number of doses uh, cannot have access. And um, and so this is these are the mechanisms that are uh, happening all the time. Basically, there's no I know no crisis without having this kind of situation. So, but um, really, the challenges for vaccine equity are many, and there are different factors. And and I think it's very important to understand this complexity because it goes much beyond the the. the the number of doses or or the the the, uh, the capacity to pay. I mean, it's it's much more complex than that, and I think it's very important to understand the complexity of equity. Uh, otherwise, you may uh, find solutions that are uh, 
uh, really missing the point. So, um, because in, in inequitable access, we also have issues of countries that are ill prepared. Sometimes you send vaccine and it stay uh, on the tarmac of the airport because they don't have a place to uh, keep the vaccine uh, or they don't have the trucks to um, uh, distribute the vaccine in the country. Um, you have um, uh, some formulation, let's take for example, uh, during COVID-19, uh, mRNA vaccine, uh, uh, some of them were requiring uh, ultra cold chain at minus 80 degrees. So not every country in the world has this kind of capacity. So even if you have the vaccine, it doesn't mean that you can use the vaccine. Uh, there was also um, uh, mistrust uh, uh, in certain countries uh, of the vaccine, and you have talked about it, I suppose, in the yesterday and and uh, in in your conversation, but uh, this is also uh, an important factor. Um, there is a low production at the beginning because maybe um, uh, companies are not sure about the demand, and so they they scale up production in a very uh, uh, lengthy manner. So. Um, etc. So there are a number of obstacles to equity, and we need to understand this, um, uh, the, the complex, um, uh, inter intricate factors to be better, uh, to be able to address uh, equity issues. And equity, for me, it's really uh, uh, an important uh, underlying uh, value for the entire process. It starts with the uh, uh, research and development, where we need to uh, develop products that could be used in any setting on Earth. And again, I'm taking the example of a vaccine that requires an ultra cold chain at minus 80, uh, by definition, will uh, create an additional challenge for equity. Uh, it's about the manufacturing. And as you know, currently, there is lots of discussion uh, in uh, having uh, more uh, manufacturers, vaccine manufacturers in uh, uh, developing countries uh, and the tech transfer that goes with it and also all the uh, intellectual property issues. Um, and at the end, it's uh, really the supply chain and, and the procurement of, of vaccine uh, that uh, is at stake. And of course, uh, the issue of regulatory oversight, because for instance, uh, even with uh, MPOX, we had a stockpile of um, take over mat, the antivirals for MPOX, and many countries couldn't receive it because um, it was not uh, pre-qualified by WHO. Uh, we didn't have an emergency use license for it either. And the countries uh, didn't have uh, the regulatory, uh, I mean, regulatory authorities. Uh, and so they couldn't authorize the importation of the drug. So even when you have it, it doesn't mean that it can get used and, and distributed. So crises are very special moments uh, in the life of humanity. Uh, we do have a lot of crises, but I think it's it's really where uh, we have issues between uh, the production and the demand. And usually at the beginning of uh, an epidemic or a pandemic, there is very high demand and a very low production. So you have to match uh, these. And, um, and so... Uh, at WHO, because we are managing this at global level, uh, usually what happens is that uh, there is demand in all countries, but uh, of course, uh, low income countries uh, have more difficulty to access the product, especially if it's not product produced in high quantities. So there are different uh, approach to uh, increase uh, the production or the availability of vaccine. Uh, for example, it's using uh, uh, adjuvant to increase uh, uh, even with the same uh, quantity of antigen, you can uh, increase the number of doses. Um, or if we have uh, divided doses, for example, for yellow fever outbreak response, uh, we have used uh, um, uh, one fifth of the dose so that we can uh, distribute it to more people. You can also increase production, but it's not always easy to increase production. It depends really uh, the type of platform that is used and how fast the company can uh, increase this. Or you can increase the, t the number of manufacturers. And for example, uh, for influenza, uh, there was at least uh, during the last pandemic, uh, this idea of maybe using uh, the veterinary um, uh, production uh, lines to produce uh, human vaccines, for instance. 
So I will describe three situations in which we have tried to develop um, uh, equitable system to, to deploy and allocate vaccine. Uh, one uh, situation is with a known disease uh, where you can, because the disease is known and you have a vaccine, you can just increase the production. And so uh, if you uh, uh, work in advance with vaccine manufacturers, they can also prepare, uh, get prepared to increase this production. Um, uh, but uh, it depends really uh, uh, on the type of uh, platform that are being used. And uh, for instance, for influenza, uh, there is the issue of the switch between uh, seasonal influenza vaccine and the pandemic vaccine, uh, because um, uh, if the production of seasonal vaccine is ongoing, maybe it's better to finish the production of seasonal uh, influenza uh, before starting pandemic vaccine. And so uh, this issue of when to switch uh, is a big issue. Uh, the second situation where it's a new disease, you don't know the disease, there is no vaccine. And so you have to uh, first uh, def um, develop a vaccine, uh, then uh, have the clinical trials and then marketing authorization and so on. So it's, uh, it takes time. But we have seen during COVID-19 that you can really reduce uh, this uh, time, uh, uh, at least for COVID, it was uh, less than one year. So it's, it's possible, but it requires a lot of investment and, and work. Um, and it's very hard to uh, get prepared before the crisis because you don't know who will be producing this vaccine. So you cannot work uh, before the, the crisis uh, with the manufacturers to uh, develop scenarios and see how the vaccine production can be uh, increased in case of crisis. And we have a third situation where we have recurring epidemics or epidemics that we know that can happen. And in this case, we are also uh, having stockpiles of vaccine uh, that are constituted so that uh, uh, we can respond to uh, outbreaks at that time. So let me just go uh, give you a little bit more detail on those three situations so that you understand the different type of uh, uh, architecture we have put in place to address uh, this issue. So for the known vaccine is really, uh, the best example is flu. Uh, flu vaccine is used in certain countries in the world on a seasonal basis. Um, and uh, we have um, um, uh, two uh, types of vaccine, uh, vaccine for the Northern Hemisphere, vaccine for the Southern Hemisphere, and, uh, and it's done every year. Uh, but you see on this slide that during the influenza pandemic, uh, vaccines, uh, high income countries had access to vaccine in fall 2009 and the pandemic started in April 2009. So they really were ready for the first wave, while uh, other uh, low income countries, they had to wait more than one year to get access to the vaccine. Um, so after the 2009 pandemic, member states of WHO uh, convened and decided to have uh, the PIP framework, the Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Framework, to address uh, this issue of inequity. And at that time, the, 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 the tension was between the sharing of viruses, because you need to share viruses to define the composition of the flu vaccine. And we have a huge network of laboratory uh, with 156 laboratories around the world constantly sharing viruses to define what are the circulating influenza viruses and which ones are predominant so that we put the antigen into the vaccine uh, for the next season. Uh, and so some countries said this system is very unfair because we share the viruses. Then in other countries, you will produce the vaccine, have all the benefits of the vaccine while we have given you the raw material. And us giving you the virus, we cannot even access the vaccine or pay for this vaccine because it's too expensive for us. So that's why they developed this PIP framework to put on an equal footing the sharing of viruses and the access to the benefit arising from the sharing of viruses. And so uh, it's a partnership with uh, uh, industry, civil society organization, other stakeholders, WHO, the member states, and they have defined a way uh, to operate a more equitable uh, uh, system uh, for the world. And so uh, we, because we know the manufacturers of vaccine, antivirals and diagnostic for flu, uh, we have already a pre-contract with them called SMTA2s. And uh, we have uh, been able to secure 
uh, access to uh, 405 million doses of vaccine, 25 million of syringes, 10 million of treatment antiviral courses, and 250,000 diagnostic kits. Um, uh, that will be available for us real time. It means that we won't get this vaccine one year after the start of the pandemic, but as they produce the vaccine, they will set aside 10% for developing country. And this is why we have this amount of roughly 400 million doses. An unknown disease, a good example is COVID-19. And because I know that Hanna will talk about uh, uh, COVAX, so I won't uh, talk a lot about it here, but just uh, at the beginning of, of COVID-19, there was no vaccine, no treatment, and, and no diagnostics. So uh, um, WHO and other partners decided to build a partnership to accelerate uh, the access to uh, those products, so the development of the product, but also uh, the distribution and the access. And so uh, Act A was born like that, uh, with a number of partners uh, joining these efforts. And, um, and this is the, the, the vaccine vaccine pillar was uh, really, um, um, and COVAX was really the, the, uh, the, the implementer of the vaccine pillar, uh, making sure that the vaccine can be um, uh, procured and then distributed to the rest of the world. So uh, just a global uh, a snapshot of what has happened, but by March 2023, 16.2 billion vaccine has been delivered from all sources. And COVAX has delivered 1.96 billion to 146 countries. Um, what you see on this graph, or you don't see, but maybe just to show that there are many uh, different sources of vaccine. So, of course, vaccine manufacturers have done bilateral deals with countries. Um, and also some countries uh, have distributed um, uh, their own vaccine production. Uh, for example, China you, has distributed um, more than COVAX, actually, uh, more than 2 billion uh, vaccine doses to a, a number of countries uh, based on their uh, bilateral uh, aid. Uh, and so uh, that's why, uh, the, the, uh, just to say that it's not uh, one mechanism for the entire world, there have been a lot of mechanism in play uh, to distribute vaccine. And so that's why also the, the complexity of the equity issue, uh, because uh, you have at the same time very different sources of vaccine and very uh, different demand uh, for those vaccines. But COVAX really was crucial for uh, most of um, uh, advanced market commitment participants and, and low-income countries because many countries, as I said, couldn't have access uh, on their own bilaterally to uh, the global stocks. And so uh, joining COVAX was a, an excellent way for them to access vaccine in a timely manner. And uh, But Hannah will talk more about it, so I will skip those slides. COVAX was not perfect, but I think there are lots of lessons to be learned. Uh, I think what is important is to see that every outbreak, every epidemic, every pandemic is different. So we need to learn the lesson from the previous one, but knowing that whatever happens, we will have to adapt. We'll have to develop new ways of doing things because the next one will be different. And so, but it's very important to take those lessons learned to so see how we can uh, uh, preemptively build mechanism that will uh, be uh, at least uh, address this inequity issue and try to have less inequity in the world next time. And the last uh, type of uh, mechanism that was built in uh, 1997 uh, with meningitis initially, it's really having emergency stockpiles of vaccines so that countries uh, in need uh, for vaccine urgently can access them. So we have now um, stockpiles for yellow fever, meningitis, Ebola and cholera outbreaks. And uh, this uh, mechanism called ICG is uh, managed uh, through a partnership as well with MSF, IFRC, UNICEF and WHO. And uh, the, the stockpile are funded by uh, international partners. For example, Gavi is a major donor for this um, um, stockpile, but also we are receiving a vaccine from countries. Uh, for example, for yellow fever, Brazil is producing its own vaccine and is donating also to WHO uh, global stockpiles. And so uh, the only way for vaccine to access those stockpile is as to show that they have an ongoing outbreak and they need the vaccine. And then uh, if 
uh, they are uh, low mid low income countries then uh, some most of the time it's a donation uh, but if they can pay for the vaccine we uh, try to have uh, them uh, paying back uh, the stockpile so that we can uh, buy new vaccine next year and so you can see on our website uh, we have a dashboard and you can see how vaccines are located where are the outbreaks and how long does it take for the vaccine to be uh, shipped to those countries so in a nutshell, we have already three uh, different mechanisms that are uh, available for vaccine uh, equitable access. Uh, the PIP framework, which is only for influenza, uh, it's only targeting low and middle income countries, and it's a partnership within with member states and, and uh, other stakeholders. Um, we have ACTE as an experience. So ACTE was for COVID-19, and uh, it was... Uh, um, uh, for a broader range of country uh, than uh, low and middle income countries and it was a group of uh, many partners international partners trying to um, uh, help uh, with the access to countermeasures and you have the ICG which is uh, based on stockpiles for uh, four disease and uh, it's anybody can access but it's based on uh, public health needs so you need to have uh, an outbreak to be able to access those vaccines so just because the title of the session and uh, let's see, yes, I have still five minutes. Title of the session was vaccine access and demand. So I just uh, uh, trying to highlight the demand in term when you are facing a crisis. So first timeliness is critical. Needless to say that in 2009, when we received the vaccine for uh, developing countries, one year later, the first wave was uh, gone. And so uh, many developing countries said, we don't want the vaccine, just keep it for you. Because for us, implementing a vaccination campaign is costly because it's not only the vaccine, you have to pay for the cost of distribution, vaccination and so on. And usually we know that um, even if you pay the vaccine $1, for instance, you will have to spend $1.5 or $2 for the uh, vaccination campaign. So it's a cost for the, the country. And many countries said, no, we don't want to do this. So the demand was really reduced if you are not timely. Secondly, uh, really the vaccine, is it normally vaccines are for prevention? Uh, and here we are talking about an ongoing outbreak. So is the vaccine the right tool to control an outbreak? Is the vaccine reducing transmission or is the vaccine reducing mortality? Uh, for some vaccines, you know, and it was the case with the cholera vaccine, the time to distribute the vaccine and then the time for the vaccine to be effective in mounting uh, right immunity in the population, sometimes the outbreak is over. So you are really to understand, is it useful to use the vaccine now? And for cholera, frankly, we have decided it would be better to immunize the population before the outbreak, especially when it's seasonal outbreak, rather than doing it during the outbreak. And finally, the opportunity crossed. Many countries have uh, many different type of uh, infectious threats, many different um, um, risks, and, uh, and they have to uh, balance uh, the need for this vaccine uh, compared to other vaccines or other uh, treatments and so on. And so um, uh, sometimes, I mean, here in case of COVID, the, the treatments are very expensive, uh, but sometimes the treatments are not so expensive. And sometimes it's even uh, better for a country to decide to treat uh, the people who are getting sick rather than to vaccinate the entire country, for instance. So you have to make those calculations and see how uh, good would be the vaccine in this type of uh, of crisis and situation. And uh, at least for COVID, uh, uh, the, I, mean, I was shocked to see that uh, for Paxlovid, they even um, uh, want to even uh, increase the cost of the treatment course. So I think, uh, uh, yes, uh, countries will have really to think uh, very carefully about how to uh, deal with COVID in the future. So one of the challenge for COVID has been really because the virus has been evolving. And so on one hand, it was good because clearly Omicron is much more transmissible than the first strain, the ancestral strain, but uh, the severity is much lower. 
I mean, it's much less virulent than initially. Uh, maybe also because the, the population has mounted a sort of kind of immunity now, being vaccinating or natural immunity. But the fact is that the mortality linked to COVID now, it's much less than it was at the beginning of COVID-19 in 2020. But the problem when the virus evolves is that if you want to have an effective vaccine, you need also to um, adapt the composition of the vaccine to uh, the viruses that are circulating. And this is very challenging with uh, COVID because we really don't know yet uh, where Omicron will evolve or if we have uh, if we will have an emerging variant in the coming months or weeks. So uh, it's, a very, it's a challenge for the production of vaccine, but it's a challenge as well for equity because uh, obviously if you have a new vaccine that is more efficient, uh, we will en end up in the same situation at the beginning of the pandemic where rich country will buy this new vaccine first and then uh, there will be a lot of leftover with uh, a previous uh, vaccine strain because nobody will want it. So. Then, of course, um, and you have been talking about it uh, yesterday and today, so I will not uh, emphasize too much on it, but the perception of the public vis-à-vis -vis the vaccine is very important because this will drive the demand, and uh, in many countries, the demand of the population drives also uh, the decision maker to buy or not the vaccine. And uh, and I think here what I wanted to highlight is really uh, most of the time we, we talk about the product, uh, and, uh, uh, we, um, and, and uh, we don't separate enough, in my opinion, what is the product and what is the attitude towards vaccination or the perception of the public towards vaccination. And uh, for me, it's slightly different because um, if you take the, the COVID-19 vaccine, um, the product, uh, it has been very challenging because um, uh, the messaging around those vaccines, and I think uh, our colleagues from Indonesia alluded to it, uh, uh, is that initially uh, uh, the target was 70% uh, coverage in the population because uh, we thought that the vaccine would help to stop transmission. But very rapidly, uh, we realized that the vaccine doesn't stop transmission. So, uh, and even when you change the messages, the population doesn't nearly, doesn't always understand that the, the message has changed because the evidence is, is new and, and we know more about the disease. So, um, so then there was this confusion. Why are we obliged to take a vaccine where the vaccine doesn't even protect against the disease? So, um, and so uh, I think this, uh, the, and this is the nature of crisis. Uh, it's evolving over time. So we need also to communicate in a way that uh, we need to anticipate that we will have to deliver different types of message and, and communicate about strategies um, at different time. Uh, and so I think this has been really a, a major challenge about the product. And there was also multiple vaccine platform. And, and so it's very hard to make people understand that this vaccine is different from this vaccine is different from this vaccine, because for most of the people, a vaccine is a vaccine, full stop. Uh, and then the safety of the, of the product, I think um, initially um, uh, uh, there was uh, limited communication about the adverse effect. Um, which is understandable because we didn't know much about those adverse effects. But the problem is that when you don't communicate about it, then people imagine things. And sometimes the imagination goes really beyond the reality. And so uh, there have been a lot, a lot of concerns about the safety of this vaccine. While currently it has been uh, uh, given to uh, billions of people, and, and I think there, have, there are adverse effects, but they might not be as frequent as as uh, it seems, but the problem is that because we don't have uh, good numbers about it, uh, the lot of uh, rumors and, and uh, uh, misinformation is circulating uh, about it. And so I think the, the, the talking about vaccination is, is very important because the, the problem we face now, and it was the same after the 2009 pandemic, uh, there was a lot of mistrust toward the flu vaccine at that time. The problem is that this mistrust about one particular product uh, contaminated uh, the rest of the, the other vaccines and the other product and the vaccination in general. So a mistrust towards one product 
can really affect the entire perception of vaccination. And so we need, I think, to be uh, very, very cautious about it uh, for the next crisis and try to really differentiate communication about a particular product and communication about vaccination in general. And, and when we explain to people how vaccination work, it's not big, just for COVID, it's for other diseases as well and, and make people understand this difference. So um, uh, those have been virus perception and you have been talking about it, I'm sure so. And, um, what I think was very uh, important with COVID-19, I'm sure Tina, you have talked about it, is really how uh, uh, at the end the polarization of society around certain uh, um, countermeasures. So you have pro-mask, anti-mask, pro-vax, anti-vax, and so on. And there have been a growing mistrust toward experts, scientists, health authorities, uh, and uh, I think uh, Courtney uh, talked about it uh, this morning about the trust and how the trusted sources have, have changed during the the the, the uh, this pandemic. For me personally, my lessons learned, and this is something that I try to put in the guidance that WHO is putting out now. Is first, I think instead of targeting a product and a vaccine, uh, I think we should uh, focus much more on how can we build trust. Build trust in in a vaccine, of course, uh, but build trust in all countermeasures, not only vaccine, uh, treatments, uh, diagnostics, mask, uh, anything that can help people to be uh, healthier. And I think the focus on, on products, um, uh, especially commercial products, and the focus on, 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 um, on the measure itself rather than uh, focusing on, on the trust and the relationship between uh, the institution and the population, the government and the population, I think has uh, uh, really um, uh, drive this polarization. And, and for me, uh, uh, I really, and this is what we try to put now in our PRET, for example, guidance, trying to really put the building the trust uh, uh, as a, a, a very important uh, approach. Uh, saying that, um, and, and some of our colleagues are saying this, that uh, trust is as important as vaccine. So, um, and unfortunately, in my opinion, we are investing a lot of billions into vaccine research and, and nearly nothing into uh, a trust research. Uh, while I think we should uh, uh, see those things going both hand in hand and, and we should uh, uh, support research in, in both fields. Uh, if not equitably, but at least uh, uh, put more resource on this. So, as I said, now the equity is at the center of the discussion of all member states and uh, the treaty is just around this issue of vaccines, uh, intellectual property rights, um, uh, transfer of manufacturing capacities, etc. So it's, it's really an important topic. And uh, uh, so the discussion is ongoing. Uh, uh, and uh, next week they will start uh, uh, talking about the negotiating text. If you have uh, time, you can look at it. And, and I think it's very important because uh, if we cannot uh, provide a solution to this equity issue, uh, I'm very afraid that the, the pandemic accord uh, will have difficulty to be uh, uh, adopted in, in, uh, in May 2024. Uh, and I think that's why... Um, your group and, and other group, I mean, we all have uh, something to do with it. We need to provide solutions because uh, uh, it's not enough to talk about it. We need to see how we can in the future um, reduce inequity uh, in access to countermeasures. So with this, I thank you very much.